waiting for it to okay it says we're live so i'm going to trust that it's not lying welcome back um, as we continue john's gospel as we start to get to the end of john's gospel um, there's a change jesus has been teaching is he's trying to get everything into his disciples before his crucifixion uh, get as much taught to them as he can but there's a shift in conversation jesus was having a conversation with his disciples as they walked along and in the same conversant tone he shifts from talking to his disciples to talking to god prayer is, is conversation um, and he does this for their benefit so we begin with chapter 17 beginning of chapter 17 verses 1 through 5. when jesus had said this he raised his eyes to heaven and said father the hour has come give glory to your son so that your son may glorify you just as you gave him authority over all people so that he may give eternal life to all you gave him now this is eternal life that they should know you the only true god and the one whom you sent jesus christ i glorify you on earth by accomplishing the works that you gave me to do now glorify me father with you with the glory that i had with you before the world began this prayer in john 17 is the longest recorded prayer we have of jesus in the new testament he begins his prayer with a simple address father uh, we have become used to this as the normal Christian way of beginning a prayer. However, it was highly unusual in, in the day. Um, it signified a very different relationship. Um, and the translation, um, Father, um, is, well, for me, and I don't know, maybe for, for others it's not, but it's very formal and uh, that's not it wasn't a formal relationship jesus had with the father uh, he was talking to god as a little child speaking to his parent but when god is addressed we usually add some qualifier we don't usually say father we say uh, our father in heaven um, god was so great and so high that he would not be addressed in language that would be appropriate for familiar use. Um, it just wouldn't happen within the family. God's not part of the family, but he, for us, he is. For, for them, that was uh, unheard of. But Jesus consistently uses this way of speaking to God, the Heavenly Father. Um, I believe Jesus made it possible for Christians today, for Christians period to enjoy an incredible level of intimacy with the father we can actually experience at least a portion of the intimacy of, with the father which the lord enjoyed in his, his prayer life by calling him daddy that's what abba really translate at, translates as it doesn't translate as father uh, it's like you know, father is a title father is a, uh, a kind of word of respect I never called my father father in fact if i did he might have looked at me askance like what, what's that it was always dad or daddy uh, daddy when i was little dad when i got older um and, and that's how jesus as a 30 something year old man still talked about his father still referred to god as daddy and i think through the centuries and in, in the translation that just seemed a little too familial, even for, for Christians. And so it got to, oh, it's Father. It's just, yes, that's that means. But I can tell you, uh, and I've shared this before, I'm sure, and, and the other Gospels, one of the greatest experiences I had the first time I was in the Holy Land was our bus driver brought us not home at the end of the day. It was like, where are we going? This, this is back to Jerusalem. And I'm thinking, he's not going to kidnap us, is he? And he brings us to this little development and a little cul-de-sac and, and with a big orange bus and pulls over and his 
his wife and son come out, and his son was a little boy, who comes running out to him with his arms open. Abba, 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 Abba. And you know, with all that excitement, and it, his father just bends down, picks him up, gives him a hug. And it's like, I get it. It's, 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 that's the relationship Jesus has with God. That's the relationship he invites us to have with God. Not like, yes, 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 Father, you know, um, bowing down and, and scraping, but coming to him like this, just running to God that we may be embraced. Um, I think if we think of God as daddy, um, it changes the nature of the relationship. Um, we, we can't forget the holiness or the majesty of the one we address as father. And, and there's no call by using the term daddy or Abba for slop, moral sloppiness or irreverence. That's not an excuse. Um, intimacy with God that Jesus invites us to is a privilege which should inspire humility in us, um, gratitude and reverence. Have you ever had a child snuggle up to you? Um, I have lots of memories of, of that. In fact, I have a picture of that. It was when I was stationed back home. My grandniece, we were watching something together and she wanted to sit right up next to me. And I was sitting in a, like a recliner. Of course, she's a little peanut. <laughs> she comes and climbs up into my lap and snuggles up and then brings her blanket and covers us up under a blanket or watch some Disney movie. They didn't, don't even remember the movie, I just remember that feeling of having this little one who trusts me and wants to be with me and holding her and her holding me. And it's like, yeah, that's, that, that's what we are invited to. Prayer not only glorifies God, but also acknowledges that the preaching and the hearing of God's word is not enough. You know, just if your parents only just lectured to you, wouldn't be much of a relationship, would it? Um, it's it's the love that comes through, that loving, that connection that that we have, that we are invited to. If we are only going to God in prayer, saying, "All right, God, uh, these are the things that need I need in my life." Boom, boom, but with our little grocery list, can you take care of these things? Um, you could do that with a paid servant. Um, God is not our servant. He will serve us, but he calls us again to serve him. Um, Jesus, in this prayer, reveals his authority over the world to his disciples at a critical point, just before he's put to death. He's revealing that he's still in control. It's not like he doesn't say, Father, I don't know what's going on. You know, get me out of here. But rather, he talks to his daddy and um, is grateful to him and wants his disciples, wants those who follow him to know, yes, don't ever be afraid. I always thought it was a disservice to my father or my mother would say, and some of you mothers out there might might have said this to your children. Oh, wait till your father gets home. You're going to get it. Well, all that did is, is, you know, I would kind of hide from my father. My father had no idea what I had done or what was going on with, between my mother and I. But all he knew is that his son was, you know, not being around him. You know, I'll just lurk in the shadows and stay out of sight, you know, out of sight, out of mind, maybe out of spanking range. Um, and I really think it, it, like I said, it did a disservice to that relationship because instead of saying, Abba, 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 it's like, oh, dad's home, run and hide. Um, and more often than not, there was never any repercussions. It was never like, okay, your mother talked to me and we need to talk. Um, but that fear was enough to kind of drive a wedge. That's why Jesus constantly reminds us to not be afraid, to trust.
and he reveals his own trust even in the face of they're walking they're heading to the crucifixion they're, they're heading to his uh, demise as, as a human a physical person um, and yet he's trusting in God the Father so he continues I reveal your name to those whom you gave me out of this world they belong to you and you gave them to me and they have kept your word now they know that everything you gave me is from you because the words you gave me I have given to them and they accepted them and truly understood that I came from you and that they have believed that you sent me I pray for them I do not pray for the world but for the ones you have given me because they are yours and everything of mine is yours everything of yours is mine and I have been glorified in them now we start to get into John's <laughs> cyclical conversation this will forward to that that'll go back to this it's like what, 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 what are you saying here so let's clarify the things that have been accomplished in the lives of the disciples are those things which Jesus himself has accomplished one He's revealed the Father to them. Two, he has given them his word. The Father's word through the word of Jesus. And he has been glorified by them. The actions, the signs that John records in his gospel are signs of, of God's glory and the disciples recognize God's power in Christ. Mission accomplished. He has done, he, he can leave this earth knowing I did what I came to do I did what I was supposed to do and um, if we wait for the perfect we miss out on on what might be uh, and Jesus didn't leave perfect disciples behind but he did do what he was supposed to do and he has to trust that his disciples in ourselves will do what we need to do pick up the ball continue moving down the road um, continue carrying the message of God and so and now I am no longer I will no longer be in the world but they are in the world while I am coming to you Holy Father keep them in your name just as you've the name that you've given me so that they may be one as we are when I was with them I protected them in your name that you gave me and I guarded them and none of them was lost except the son of destruction in order that the scripture might be fulfilled but now I am coming to you I speak this in the world so they may share my joy completely I gave them your word and the world hated them because they do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world I do not ask you to take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one they do not belong to the world any more than I belong to consecrate them in the truth your word is truth as you sent me into the world so I send them into the world and I consecrate myself for them so that they also may be consecrated in truth we will hear truth come up um, later in, in this um, that Jesus came to testify to the truth the truth is the word of God uh, and he came to speak that word to be that word and to show others that truth he understands that his disciples while not perfect have been consecrated in the truth they are they are now connected to that word and he has kept his disciples safe he now asks his father to do that because he physically will no longer be with them there's a threefold outcome He's hoping for the, their unity in him, their joy in him, and the fulfillment of their mission. Notice that Jesus calls for joy, which his disciples will experience uh, my joy, not our joys. Um, the joy Jesus speaks of is, is not, we had a great time at that wedding in Cana. Boy, we had all that wine. Boy, that was joyful. Uh, no. The joy that Jesus speaks of, just as when Jesus speaks of love, he means something very specific, um, is that it's not freedom 
from suffering and pain. I think we figure, oh, okay, well, God's joy means I won't suffer or experience pain. I won't have any persecutions. Um, and in fact, as we said before, most of them will lose their lives because of Christ. Um, the joy that Jesus talks about is doing, fulfilling the, the work of God the Father. Doing that simple task that they were given and seeing how it comes together. I, I mentioned this yesterday at Mass because to me it, was, it, it is still it's a source of great joy. Uh, and it had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with God. And I've shared this story before. I'm sorry. If you've heard it before, you're going to hear it again because it is such a powerful story for me. And it's uh, the story of, and the names had not changed. I thought of it afterwards as uh, Angela and Mary. So we have Angel and Mary um, who were both at National Institutes of Health in DC. And um, I was chaplain there to cancer surgery and to pediatric cancer. When I showed up one day down on the second floor of pediatric cancer, I met Angela, who was a girl in her 20s. And I said to her, Gee, you know, is there no room upstairs for you? They, that, that was probably to have you down here with the kids. And she goes, no. And she was sitting at the mirror brushing her hair. And she says, no, I have a type of cancer that they consider a pediatric cancer. So they have me here because this is where they, I said, oh, what, what's, what's up? And she said, well, I have this kind of bone cancer so in my hip, so they're going to have to do a hemipelvectomy. And I said, I'm not familiar with that. Sad to say, I became quite familiar with that when my cousin's husband needed a hemipelvectomy a few years later. Um, they were going to take her leg, her right leg, and half her pelvis. And she told me that like this, like a doctor telling you know a, a class of medical students. And I said, you seem awfully matter-of-fact about it. And she said, I either lose my leg or I lose my life, and I got a lot of living to do. So, and I, you know, carried on the conversation, but I really left thinking, she's got to be in denial. There's no way she can be. Um, this so well adjusted to this. Um, and when I left her, I went upstairs to the seventh floor and I walked past this room that had no visitors on it. So I went to the nurse's station and I said, oh, what's the word with Mary there? It says no visitors. Is she like in quarantine? Oh no, she doesn't want to see anyone. That's like raving, <laughs> waving a red flag in front of a bowl for me. She doesn't want to see anyone. Well, that's a challenge. So I literally had just left Angela. I walked into Mary's room, completely dark. Blinds are closed, lights are off, filled with flowers and cards. And I said, Mary? She said, yes. And I walked over to her and she said, I said, uh, I introduced myself. And I said, uh, I'm here from the chaplain's office. Uh, what's going on? Oh, my life is over. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. You want to talk to me? He says, well, I've got cancer and I'm going to have to lose my leg below the knee. They're going to take my leg off below the knee. And I said, well, it sounds like you're going to lose your foot, but not your life. What difference is it? What, there's no sense in going on. And I said, what do they say after? Oh, no, they said, you know, if they do that, they'll, they'll have the cancer. It'll be gone. And I said, well, and I pointed to all the flowers and cards. I said, do you think the people who sent you all of these things only love you because you have two full legs? Is that, is that you know, trying to get a, just a crack of a smile out of her. She goes, no, but there's no sense in going on after this. It's just, you know. And so, like I say, I literally had just left Angela. I said, you know, I have another patient who's having a similar operation. Mind you, her operation was two or three times as worse. Would it be okay if she talked with you? He goes, yeah, okay. And I went down, left her, went downstairs, talked to Angela, and I said, I have a girl up on seven who thinks her life is over. Oh, yeah. The following week I go in. The first place I go is to Angela because I was concerned that, you know, as much as, as brave as she talked after the surgery, she came down the hallway on crutches and said, oh, come on down to the solarium, spun around, hops down there. We chatted. It's like 
she was just as enthusiastic. I was like, wow. So I said, have you ever a chance to talk to Mary? Oh, yeah, I've been talking to her every, going up there every day talking with her. And I said, oh, great. So I left and I went upstairs. And I get to Mary's room, the door's open, but the room was packed with people. Lights were on, windows open, the vines are open. And I, I said, is Mary in there? And, and she hears my voice and says, Bob, and the crowd, like the Red Sea, just parted. And I, I find my way over to her. She throws her arms around me, gives me her hug. Her parents are standing at the end of the bed in tears and, you know, thanking me. And it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, God gave me a plug and then he gave me a socket. And he actually gave me the brains to say, what if we put these two things together? You know, I didn't tie them in a knot and said, well, let's see. I don't know if the other end of this is on, but we'll put it together and see. And that's all I did. I made that little connection and the power of God glowed and made a radical change in Mary's life. Um, jump to the, the future. I see Mary who oh, many months later on an elevator um, standing with a cane. She says, oh, Bob, get off of my floor. So I get off and I said, what you doing here? She says, I'm here to return the cane. And I said, oh. And so she did a little pirouette with her artificial leg. And she says, no, I have my prosthesis and I'm used to it now and I'm fine. And everything's great. And, and I'm going to uh, Sandals in uh, Jamaica. I said, well, to me, for a person who thought her life was over because she was going to lose part of her leg, to go to a beach for a week. Um, there's no way really you can hide that. I don't care how much makeup you put on. <laughs> it's going to be obvious that and it showed me how powerful the healing was in her. That she went from life is over to nope. This is who I am now and I'm glad that they got it and I'm glad that it's done and we move on from there. Um, that joy still comes to me when I think of the story. It's, it's, it's not, you know, the disciples didn't do anything and you'll hear about it, you know, in the Acts of the Apostles when, when they say, oh, I, have, I don't have silver or gold, but in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And it's like, oh, you know, they knew they had nothing. I know I have nothing to give except when God puts this and this, like, oh, here's peanut butter, here's jelly, what a nice sandwich. Um, but it, it's not anything I did. I didn't create the peanut butter and I didn't make the jelly. Um, I didn't even have the bread to put it on. It's all gift from God. And that's truly the power of, of that joy of, oh, wow, to see God work in our midst. Um, and if you think about it, the times Jesus fed the, the crowds, there was enough food there for the disciples. So it's not like, gee, look, at we have all this extra food. They were excited over the fact that, look, at everyone has this. God gives an abundance to all. It's not us, it's God. And certainly Jesus calls us to have his joy, the joy of knowing even despite what's coming up, the suffering, the rejection, the pain, um, that I have done the work of God. And there's that joy. When Jesus talks about the joy that the world does not give, the joy that passes all understanding, that's what he's talking about. All right. Sorry, I kind of digressed a bit. Um, we continue in verses 20 and 21. I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe me through their word so that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. This is a prayer the Friars of the Atonement pray daily. It is, it is our unity prayer. It's the ultimate prayer for unity in God, for unity in oneself, for unity with others, and ultimately unity with God. The things that we work for, I mean, it is Jesus' prayer. That's, you know, and, and we have a hand in making that prayer come true by working for that unity. 
and not we just the friars of the atonement it just happens to be one of our charisms to to really foster that unity um, but the goal of unity is not simply for ourselves that isn't this great we're all at one and isn't that true i mean that that's great that i will say it's great to be at one in yourself it's great to be in, in union with others and it's really great to be at one with god but it, the goal of it is that the world may believe in christ by our actions by our words um, if we you know look back to the acts of the apostles the christians before the word christian was ever coined they were known as those people who loved each other that their love was so profound um, in, in Christ's prayer that people looked at them and said, wow, they're, they're so different. They're, and, and yet, they're one. Now, I don't want to get Pollyanna-ish, but you know, I've shared this. And in a good sp sp moment, uh, the friars have accepted it. And you know, we had to share our stories about, you know, coming to the friars I said my first experience with the friars were, was back home and there were probably at least six friars living there every one of them vastly different from the others and all doing various ministries and yet there was a unity there there was a oneness they weren't cookie cutters that wasn't like they came out of the assembly line they were vastly different from each other and had vastly different skills and talents and yet there was a oneness that spoke to me that said, wow, as different as I am, I'm invited to be one. And isn't that a wonderful feeling to be at one? Hence, atonement. That's where the Anglo-Saxon word from at one with a meant the making of at one, making of that unity. It's, it's that profound love that Christ has for us that he calls us to have. I said the other day, I said that we don't need to wear a cross, that people look and say that that person's different and there's something about them that I want. It's that love. Jesus continues, I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. So they may be brought to perfection as one, that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them even as you love me. The unity is based upon the unity that exists between the Father and the Son, or in, our, in this case, the Trinity. That you know, we can't dissect the Trinity. We can talk about the God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, but that unity is is you can't separate one from the other. You, know, you can examine various things, but they are one, and and then divine sense hence the the word trinity um, that in, in their unity jesus prays for that for us that god's love may be manifest in our lives um, and in it jesus's purpose is to glorify the father through his incarnation through his earthly life and ministry through his death resurrection and ascension the early sufferings of the Lord are just part of his glory. And this is the glory, the glory of servanthood, the glory of sacrificial service, which the Lord has given to his disciples. Just that night, when he humbly washed their feet to show this is what you are to be about, humble service, not lorditude and, and high rank, but service. The disciples' love of each other and ultimately love of others um, that they would share the word of God with derives from Christ's love for them and for God's love for Christ. We don't just manufacture love. Um, sometimes it's really difficult to love, but it's the love of God that comes to us, that fills us, that makes us carry that, that message. Um, and it's sometimes easier to love others than it is to love people who are closest to you. Uh, two weeks ago, we had First Communion, and I was 
sharing with the First Communion kids. Um, I, I think it was my first parish when I had a, a class. The teacher said, can you just do a walkthrough of the church? And so the class came over and I showed them, told them about the altar and the ambo and the presider's chair, what all these things mean, plus the vessels. And, um, and they're all just dutifully looking at me like, uh, so I said, do you have any questions? So this one kid raised his hand and he said, um, and it, I was thinking he was bragging initially, but then I realized, oh no, there's a question there. Um, he said, well, that's the tabernacle over there, right? I said, yes. I thought, hey, for seven years old, tabernacle, big word. He says, and, and Jesus is in the tabernacle. I said, okay, well, yeah, Jesus is, is reserved there in the Blessed Sacrament and whatever we've consecrated on, on Sunday, whatever is left, Jesus is present. They want to just like, we don't have Jesus locked up. I got him locked up in this box and you can't. So just, uh -huh. he says, and um, when we receive our first communion, I said, here's what I said. I said, okay, so because Jesus is in there, we either genuflect or we bow. I said, yes, out of respect. I said, okay. So when we receive first communion, Jesus is going to be in us, right? I said, yes. I'm thinking, this kid has it. This is great. He said, so shouldn't we bow or genuflect to each other? <laughs> I just grinned and I said, immediately, I said, yes, you should. But we wouldn't be able to get too much done in this world if we always were stopping and bowing and genuflecting. But it's really important. That's an excellent reminder. And not just to you guys. So I shared it with their parents. And I said, but to you guys, that we are living, walking tabernacle that Christ is in each of us. And because of that, we may not always be bowing or genuflecting to one another, but we should be treating each other like Christ. Like Christ is right there. That's the love that Jesus calls us to. That's the prayer of unity that Christ prays for us. Not, oh, I really like this person, but no, Christ is present in that person. And the things that drive me crazy don't matter. It's the love of God that's there that I hope to be immersed in and letting it flow from me that I recognize and I glorify and I share. Out of the mouths of babes, Jesus continues, Father, they are your gift to me. I wish that where I am, they also may be that they may see the glory you gave me because you loved me from the foundation of the world. And given the nature of the disciples, their lack of understanding, um, they're fighting amongst each other, they're abandoning Jesus at his most difficult hour. It's astonishing to think that Jesus would call them a gift from the Father. What a crummy gift you gave me. <laughs> but Jesus knows all of that and still thanks God for the gift that they are judging not by our standards, but by divine standards. It reveals the power of his love for us. When you really love someone, you kind of overlook the flaws and blemishes. You don't pick out every little thing and say, ah, I got that wrong. Nope, I don't like this there. Um, and that's, he shows that love for us. He knows the mistakes they made he also knows the mistakes we make, and he still loves them, and he still loves us. That's the power of this prayer, is that it's not, gee, he didn't know us. If he knew me, he wouldn't love me. And, and there was a time in my life when I was young, I, I, I thought that way. Oh, if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me at all. You would certainly wouldn't love me, so let's keep my real self hidden. It was so great, and I think maybe that was part of my conversion, is to realize I know that God knows me better than I know myself. And for some strange reason, I know that God loves me. I don't know why. I could give him a long list of reasons not to love me, and yet he still does. It's, it's that love that powers us as Christians. Uh, even with the disciples' betrayal, denial, and abandonment of him, Jesus still wants them with him in heaven. 
that says multitudes to us. He wants us. Even if we don't think we deserve it, it doesn't matter. It's not about what we deserve. God gives us love. Um, and hopefully that love will transform us. Jesus continues. I said it was the longest prayer in the New Testament. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and they know that you sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will make it known, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus knows that the Father, because he and the Father are, are one, uh, the, the, the unity that they have in God, he prays that his disciples may also have, that they truly come to know God, not just to hear, but to hear, and to, to understand that transforming love that God has for us, that transforming love that he offers us to share. God's love's not going to run out. We don't have to worry about it. Um, one of the few things we, you know, in life, well, we got to be careful. We got to got to parse this out because we might run out of it. No, the more we use the love of God, the more the love of God is present. Um, it defies our natural senses, but shows the divine senses, the supernatural sense. Okay, I won't belabor his prayer any longer. We move on to chapter 18. When Jesus had said this, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas' betrayer was also with them. So when he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said, I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off the, his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup the father gave me? This is one of those high points. <laughs> you expect lightning to be flashing. Jewish leaders were looking to arrest Jesus in private so there wouldn't be a major uprising by all of his followers. So let's find some place secluded and quiet that we can grab him. Um, thus they're bargaining with Judas to betray him in a private place where they could overwhelm him with those who were with him. And he was just there with his disciples. Judas had originally planned to betray Jesus privately without anyone knowing, but then Jesus announces at the Last Supper that he knew Judas was going to, to betray him. Um, and so he comes to him publicly in the garden. At this point, he's figured it out, so there's no sense in me like saying, oh, look at these people, what are they doing? Um, he, he comes with the bad, he brings the bad guys instead of just sending them and, and faking it. Now, the whole cohort of guards fall back when Jesus announces that he's the one they are looking for. He says, I am. They do so, not because he has bad breath. <laughs> they do so because they do not expect Jesus to own up to this. And yet Jesus speaks with such great power, they're taken aback. You know, you imagine a crowd coming to you with weapons and uh, swords and clubs and lanterns. Um, that, that's the, the that's the the Frankenstein image of like you know let's storm the castle. Um, yeah, you want to lock the door and, and bolt it and block it, and 
push the furniture up against it. You don't expect to be invited in. And yet Jesus stands there and says, I am. Right here. And they're kind of like, that's not what we expected. We, we were ready for a fight. Hence the large number of people here are ready. To, and, and there is no fight. There, there is no battle. There is no scuffle. It's simply the truth. And we know the power of truth can be very, very much um, overwhelming. Jesus speaks the truth, and they're not used to it. They're not expecting the truth. It's not, you know, they, they, they don't want to hear it, and they're bowled over by it when Jesus says so. Um, Peter must have been expecting trouble because, uh, you know, there were more and more tension between the religious leaders and Jesus. Um, they were surreptitiously entering Jerusalem at that point because they were afraid of being arrested. And Jesus, Peter brought a sword with him, not something a fisherman would normally carry. Um, so he was expecting trouble, and he was ready as he swings and cuts. It's like, even toward the end, it's like, do you not get this? <laughs> What's wrong with you? But... Um, just as Jesus is tempted in the desert by Satan, and tempted when Peter says, God forbid that you should die, and Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. So too, this is one more chance to give over to Satan and his will rather than continuing to embrace God's will. He could just, if they didn't know him, and, and you really need to be there. The last time I was in the Holy Land, um, one of the people we had there commented one of our guides if you look and it's not much different today than it is it's probably more built up today than but this way is jerusalem that way is the wilderness jesus could say oh let me go get him and in the dark step that way out into the wilderness and never be seen again they'd never find him they wouldn't chase him into the wilderness they wouldn't know even to go there. No, he was, <laughs> here I am. And I'm sure they realized, you know, he could easily slip out of here. He could be gone and, and we'd miss him. Um, so they, they are not at all ex expecting the truth and someone is bluntly saying, right here, this is the one you're looking for. So let the rest of these guys go. Don't bother them. It's not like the end of Spartacus. I am Spartacus. No, I am Spartacus. No, you know, they weren't saying I am Jesus. No, in fact, they, they were probably cowering at the time. Um, but the power of that word just being spoken so simply, so elegantly, I am, um, just blew them away, literally. Um, Jesus embraces God's will with that temptation to, he could have just walked down the hill in the darkness and they've never had him. So the band of soldiers, the tribune and the Jewish guard seized Jesus, bound him and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who counseled the Jews that it was better for one man to die rather than the people. John wants us to know that Caiaphas, before whom the Lord will stand trial, is a judge who's already made up his mind about Jesus. Caiaphas, by whom Jesus would be condemned to die, was a man that was already determined that Jesus needs to die. It's not really a trial. If you go into the judge, okay, good, we're getting rid of you. Um, it, it's absolutely not going to be a, a just, true, fair trial. Uh, that is already clear. So John tells us the only thing about Caiaphas that really matters is that his mind is already made up. Simon Peter, another disciple, followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You're not one of this man's disciples, are you? 
Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and they were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. It's quite unlikely that this woman would have gone to the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. Um, and so she wouldn't have recognized Peter as that sword-wielding fisherman uh, on her own. It's more likely that when the fire lit up Peter's face in the courtyard, at least one person who had been at the garden thought they recognized Peter and had tried to confirm it with the servant girl. The servant girl who kept the door, the doorkeeper, one of the servants, one of the slaves, and let him inside. And the girl in turn comes to Peter to confirm if he was with Jesus. And if not, why are you following him? I mean, ultimately, it's like, it's a cold night. Why are you following this, this strange man from Galilee that, you know, it's, you know, get nothing better to do? It's go home, go to bed. Don't, you know, don't mess your... So it was out of curiosity for her to ask, but there's no accusation. She didn't say, ha, you're with him. We should arrest you. She had no power. First of all, she was a woman, girl. Secondly, she was either a servant or a slave. Absolutely no power. She could do nothing. And yet Peter, in the face of such a profound challenger, said, no, no I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not with him. It's like, seriously? That will continue, because Peter will continue as well. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue or in a temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They'll know what I said. And there he is in front of Annas. Did Annas hold a trial? Probably not. This is not trial-like. It sounds like a semi-private fact-finding interrogation. Let's get some, some charges up against him. You know, we're holding him uh, on possible charges. Let's see what we can find out. So there he is in the, uh, the exam room being grilled. What is Annas interested in? Well, he asks about his accomplices and his ideology. What do you teach and the people you are with? Um, because those things are a threat to his power. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and doctrine. It's, it's not about anything else except for you're threatening my power, and I, and I don't like that. Jesus' response to them is, though, he reminds Annas that his own cronies, the Jewish leaders, know the answers. He should ask them. They've, they've all heard and seen what he has done. It's not like he has, there's no other secrets. It's I do it publicly. And um, kind of throwing it in, in his face. You want the truth? Talk to those people. That, talk to you. Don't trust me. Talk to the people you do trust, and see what they have to say. Well, we know what they're going to say. They're going to be conflicting. But when he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, "Is this any way to answer the high priest?" Jesus answered him. If I've spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I've spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Well, so we have the, the DA <laughs> sending him to the judge, who we already know the judge's decision is, yeah, it would be better if we just kill this one guy off and, and stop all of this nonsense. Um, and yet, Jesus is slapped for answering Annas in this way. Um, he, he's, the guard has slapped God for insolence. How can God be insolent? It's, it's, it's kind of unpleasant. We can be insolent. Um, and, but no, there he is slapping Jesus in the face, giving him the old backhand um, because he doesn't recognize the truth that Jesus will continue to speak to. 
Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose, Peter ear, Peter, whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with them? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. So there's the three denials that Jesus tells Peter about. And you know, the last one is absolutely sure. Here's a person with no power. They are a slave. He's still fearful. He's still fearful of, of the minuscule, not even the mighty. I mean, forget the mighty. He's probably terrified of the mighty. Here's a slave of, of the high priest. And, and, and yet he vehemently denies it. No. Why was he lying? Well, we'll get to that. Because it's like, Peter, you're acting... You're saying one thing and doing another. And although Jesus knew this about you, he told you this so that you'd know that he still loves you. Because he loved you then when he told you this. And you said, oh, no, no, I've, that'll never happen. Um, he loves you now, even though other gospel writers will say he wept bitterly. It's like, okay. Yeah, God knows. I don't know, but God knows. If anyone should have feared being arrested, it was Peter. He's the one who was guilty of attempted murder since uh, he chopped off this Malchus's ear. Um, and the last place Peter should have gone to was the high priest's house. It's like, okay, uh, I've already lashed out, and, and you know they could easily arrest me for even if not attempted murder, you know, assault. And, um, so was Peter hoping to be recognized? No, of course not. Um, if so, that hope was dashed when the servant girl asked him, are you one of these men's disciples? And it's surprising that Peter simply lied to her and said, I am not. But what he should have done is to make up some excuse to leave the high priest's house right away, first at a walk, and then at a full sprint. Um, instead, he continued to lie and stay for another hour amidst these officers who could have arrested him. Um, the third time he was recognized, Peter began to curse and swear, I don't know the man. But he still stayed. He only left after he realized that Jesus' prophecies about his denials had come true. So why did Peter stay and deny Jesus three times? Well, in his own way, Peter's trying to be protective of, look out for Jesus. What are they doing? You know, where, where are they taking him? Um, following him, albeit at a distance, to kind of keep an eye on him because, after all, you're in charge. You're the rock. I need to, to know what's happening. I, I need to know firsthand, not, not someone else's. I, so even at risk to himself, even though he lied, um, he doesn't show cowardice. A coward uh, wouldn't have attacked a mob that included tons of Roman soldiers. <laughs> Um, you know, you have one sword and you have all these armed guards there, or they wouldn't have gone anywhere near the high priest's house. Um, so it's even in his weakness, he's trying to, to show bravery. Now, did Jesus need Peter's protection? No. One of the first things I learned back in seminary is God can take care of himself just fine. He's He's okay. So then they brought Jesus to Caiaphas, to the Praetorium. Now it was morning, and they said they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order that they would not be defiled so they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came up to them and said, what charge do you bring against this man? And they answered to him, if we were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. This struck me today when I was think, looking over the readings. It's like, they didn't enter the Praetorium um, because they don't want to be defiled so they could eat the Passover. It's like, yeah, we're, we're falsely sending a person to death 
but we don't want to miss Thanksgiving dinner, so we're not going to do anything that's, you know. What about putting someone to death who who who's, doesn't deserve it? No, it, it shows how twisted our minds can be in regard to relationships with each other, with each other or relationships with God, and it's like, really? You, you don't see the problem? Oh, no, we don't want to step into the praetorium because that might defile us, but it's okay to railroad this guy and get rid of him, put him to death. It's like, you know, even if he were a criminal, to push him through as, as, as they were doing was wrong. And in fact, there are at least eight illegalities in Jesus' trial by their own rules. First, during the trial, the members of the Sanhedrin were allowed to speak in defense of the accused, but not against him. You can speak on his behalf, but you can't accuse him. Yet the high priest spoke publicly against Jesus. He spoke in blasphemy. Well, because of his power, it kind of throws a pall over all the rest of the judgment. Second, for the verdict to be valid, the trial had to be held in the hall of hewn stone inside the temple precinct. Um, the way that if you ever have a chance to look at a map of uh, the temple in Jerusalem, you'll see there are various places where various things happen, and the Hall of Hewn Stone is where judgments were held. Um, but Jesus was tried at, um, at the high priest's house, uh, not in a public space uh, where you know, people could witness and, and testify. Third, the trial could not be held at night. Yeah, Jesus' trial was held at night. Fourth, the trial could not be held during a great feast. Yeah, Jesus' trial was held during the Passover feast. All of that's supposed to be put off. Five, all witnesses had to be examined separately. Yet, yeah, the witnesses' testimony, when they didn't match, they brought together two false witnesses. Um, they, they didn't do it apart from each other so that they could hear, yeah, what he said. No, it's no what he says. It's what are you saying? And speaking your word and then saying, well, this guy's saying this and this guy's saying that. Um, no. Um, sixth, each member of the Sanhedrin had to give their verdict separately. Yet they sentenced Jesus to death together. Was, Crucify him. It's like, that's not how this works, according to your law. Seventh, the youngest member of the Sanhedrin had to render his verdict first, so he wouldn't be influenced by the older, more powerful members. Yet, at Jesus' trial, the high priest rendered the first verdict. He's committed blasphemy. And lastly, if the sentence was death, a night had to elapse after the day of the verdict before the death sentence was carried out. It was to give some time in case, well, this is, in case we're wrong, let's, Let's sleep on this. Um, and, you know, the word would get out if there were other witnesses that said, no, 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 he was with me at the time. Or, um, but no, he was nailed to the cross within a few hours. So eight, eight <laughs> violations of their own law, not, not laws that I'm making up, not laws that, well, they shouldn't have done this. They're not even following their own rules. Um, but they don't care. But they wouldn't step into this, the, the courtyard there. Oh, no, because we might not be able to have the nice feast we're having later on. <laughs> um, we might be defiled. Uh, they just don't see it. So at this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your, your law. The Jews answered him, We don't have the right... Well, I think I'm going to stop here because I want to... We'll start with... We'll pick up on pilot uh, next week because I realize we'll have the time. Um, just, just know he's in a kangaroo court here, um, where those in power already have judged. Uh, there is no judgment. It's just like, what do we need to do to expedite this person's death and get rid of them? Um, and you know, truth be damned, we don't believe in that.
I wish all of you a good week. Hopefully you're staying healthy and safe. Um, thank you for keeping me safe from COVID and everything else. I will talk to you next week. Bye.